Fifty years ago, roughly, Victor Papanak, you may not have heard of him, but at that time he was a famous designer. He wrote a book called Design for the Real World. And the first sentence of the book was, there is no profession more harmful than design. Why? Because designers produce things that are used all over the world. Things like this. This is a phone. <clears throat> this happens to be uh, Android. It's a Pixel. It's a thousand dollars. With the iPhone, you can pay a thousand five hundred. Next year, there'll be two thousand dollars. We destroy the environment to mine the exotic materials that go into this, and then it only is supposed to last two years, and then you throw it away and buy a new phone. If the battery goes dead, it, yeah, you can replace it, but not easily. Why does it only last two or three years? No real reason, except it's important for the business model of the companies to have you buy a new phone every couple of years. And what do we do with the old phones? Well, I was recently in India, and India has mountains, literally mountains, of old electronics discarded burning, burning all the time, emitting poisonous fumes. And it's just not, just not India. This sort of thing happens all around the world. So why are we doing this? And this is what Papanek was talking about, why design is so harmful. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, he was wrong. He was right, but he was wrong. And why was he wrong? Well, actually, some of the earlier speakers have given the reasons. He was wrong because he assumed that designers actually have the power to decide what to build or what to design and what not to. So I'm going to take you on a story about the, the powerful, positive power of design and the negative way it is being used and then why that negative reason is here, and what we can do about it, and what kind of social good we could do as designers. Because I've decided that I am not going to continue practicing or writing about the design of consumer goods <clears throat> for two reasons. One, I've kind of said everything I think I have to say, but second, I don't want to continue to destroy the environment in our world, so I am going to start looking at important issues like hunger, education, health. But let me start with, so why was Papanek wrong? Well, design is a funny profession. We have some really powerful tools, and I'm going to come back to that because I think the tools of human-centered design especially, are applicable to almost any activity in the world. But where are designers? Where do you work? You work in the middle levels of business. If you're a designer in a consultancy or a design firm, uh, your clients tell you what to do. And yes, you can kick back and you can say, no, no, not quite that, we should do this. But basically, your clients propose the problems for you. You don't propose them. If you work in a company, it's the same way. The people up above you, whoever they are, they decide what you should do. So you have very little power. You can do simple modifications or you can refuse to do a job. But basically, why is design in the middle level? Why aren't more designers, CEOs, and I don't mean of small companies, I mean the CEOs of very large companies. Why aren't you, why don't we have more chief design officers of companies? So when decisions are made about what to do or how the company should be run, why shouldn't we have designers there? Now there are some companies that do that, but not many. SAP has a chief design officer, therefore in the, what's called the C-suite. 
The C-suite, for those of you who haven't heard that term, uh, in part because the American labels are different than, uh, than European. So the chief executive officer, CEO, is usually the leader of the company, but that person reports to a board of directors. Uh, and then there's other people whose title has chief in it, like chief financial officer or chief product officer or chief marketing officer. Why not chief design officer? SAP has one. Philips does too. Philips has a chief design officer. And actually the companies that have design up at the very top do much better than companies that don't. But they do much better in the long term, not necessarily in the short term. So one problem is designers aren't up there and why not? And when I ask designers why not, well, there are several reasons. In part, those of you who are trained in art and architecture schools probably are trained in a school which says business is evil. And so you end up not even liking business and you don't want to do real business, you want to do design, but unfortunately if you do design, eventually you're going to be in business. And business is not evil. Not all businesses. And uh, it, business doesn't have to be evil. Business is manufacturing or providing services for people who, who need them. And making a profit is actually essential if you want to stay in business. Because if you're not making money, then you can't afford to stay in business. It doesn't matter how good your work is. Making obscene profits, that is evil. And the disparity we have between the pay that we pay the CEO, the managing director of a company, and people below, that's evil. But those, maybe we could change. So why aren't you, plural, why aren't you in higher levels of your company? Well, <clears throat> quite often I ask designers, uh, who are your customers? And the normal answer is, Oh, it's, uh, it's these people in India, or the people in Texas, or the people in the Netherlands who are using my products. No, those are not your customers. Those are the customers of the people who make the products, not your customers. Your customer is your boss, or more accurately, the boss of your boss. And if you're in a consultancy or a design firm, your customer is your client. Now, one of the principles of design is understand your customers. And most of you fail to understand your customers. I've had designers come to me and say, my company doesn't listen to me. I have some really good ideas for new directions or this and that and the other, and nobody listens. We don't have enough designers and nobody listens. And I say, okay, tell me what you tell your executives. Well, I don't. I show them the beautiful work we're doing. I show them the drawings. I show them the, the things we're doing. I show them the services we create or the products. <clears throat> and I tell them the prizes we've won and how much our customers love our work. Okay. <clears throat> but, you know, I've been an executive at a company. And if somebody came and told me that, you know what I would say? I would say, of course you do good work. That's why we hired you. I'm really pleased to hear that. The customers understand that. So thank you very much. And now, excuse me, but I have to get back to work. Here's, if you want to talk to your executives and have them listen to you, you have to ask, what is it that's important to the executives? Or if you like, how do they get promoted? They get promoted because they've increased the profits or the sales of the company, or they've increased the margins of the company, or they've decreased the costs. So, <clears throat> what you need to do is not show them drawings, you need to show them, believe it or not, a spreadsheet. In which you show, if you do this, here's the increase in sales, an increase in profits, an increase in margin, and decrease in service costs. 
And the normal response to that is, huh, how do we do that? I mean, we haven't built it yet. It's a new thing. How do I know what, this, what the profits will be or the sales will be? Well, many of you probably work in companies where the marketing people insist that you must add these three new features to whatever your device is. And how did they get that across? Well, they used a spreadsheet in which they showed how much value will come from those features. At the same time that you are saying, oh my God, those features will ruin it, it will make it even more messy and complicated to use. So how do they get those numbers? They make them up. You can make them up. They lie, so learn how to lie. Now, <clears throat> you have to be careful. They're not really lying, but they're making up the numbers. But they, look, the executives are not stupid. You may think they are, but they're not. Because actually, a lot of the executives were kind of like you at one point. They moved up. Um, the executives know the numbers are made up. But <clears throat> they say, um, are they reasonable? Do they make good sense? And so the point is, when you, would, when you give your numbers, they won't, people won't believe the numbers, but they'll look at it and see whether it makes good sense. And if it makes good sense, they may go along with you. How do you know how to make up these numbers? Well, one way is make friends with the marketing people. They're experts at it. The other way is learn something about business. Um, you may have to get an MBA degree, but you don't really need to. You can learn about business without doing that because the principles are not that difficult. But you've got to understand your executives. That's the main point. So one problem is we don't have enough market, we don't have enough designers in the decision-making levels of companies. And therefore, until we do, we are at the mercy of the companies and what we make. Okay, that's one of the problems we have. But there are other problems too. So why is it we make all this stuff and we... It's planned obsolescence, which is actually a term that started with the automobile business. The automobile business back in the 1920s and 30s deliberately designed cars that would not last. So you had to buy a new car every couple of years when the new models came out. And today, though, that's been extremely compressed. So for lots of our products, like the cell phone uh, or even the computers, uh, you're supposed to buy them much more frequently. And refrigerators used to last 15, 20 years. Ooh, that's bad for business. And so they don't last that long anymore. Why are we doing that? Well, you should be in a position of decision-making where you can ask that question. Now, there, is, there are a couple reasons why. Because even the, the, comp the CEOs of companies and the senior executives know that this is not good for the world. But the business models are bad. And part of it is we're trapped in this horrible thing. There was a, <clears throat> what I call a stupid economist, who happened to win the Nobel Prize, called Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, who, who said about 20 years ago, the company does not owe its allegiance to the customers or their employees or the in cities in which they are located or even the world. Companies owe their allegiance to their shareholders. Now, by the way, that's been highly accepted now, and that's the standard thing that all MBA schools across the world teach their students. There is absolutely no reason behind that, except it was his opinion. It's not, it's not stated legally, it's not in any law, it's uh, not in the contracts, it's not in the uh, incorporation papers of the company. But that dictates the horrible behavior we have because most of the shareholders are not ordinary people. Most of the shareholders are great big hedge funds and other kinds of financial institutions who don't care about the company. They care about making money. And the average amount of time that they hold the shares is measured in weeks or months. And therefore, what they look at is how much money have you made this quarter, these last three months? 
And as a result, we, companies are forced to continue to get increasing profits every three months instead of looking at the long term. And those profits are often made at the expense of the workers and at the expense of common sense and at the expense of the long-term viability of the company. It's crazy. But that's what we do. So, we have to change that. And I'm happy to say that there's been a larger and larger uprising of people saying this is bad, including the deans of major business schools. But it will take a decade or so to turn this around. Okay, that's one of the problems we have. There are a few other problems, too. One of them is that one of the rules of marketing is, it's a very sensible rule. The more we know about our customers, the better we can serve them. Sounds reasonable. And actually, if you're an advertiser, you don't want to waste money sending ads to people that don't pay any attention, or ads to people that it might annoy them because they have no interest. So wouldn't it be nice if we could only sell out, send advertisements to people just when they are interested in the products and might, might actually welcome the advertisement? I mean, most, many of you must like advertisements at the right time. I do. When I want to buy a new camera, I go out and I buy the camera magazines because they're filled with advertisements and reviews, and it's useful. But after I bought the camera, I don't want them anymore, thank you. And the same with when I buy an automobile, and the same with a lot of the big purchases I do research beforehand. So yeah, there's some truth to that. But the problem is that there are modern companies, oh, for example, Google, Amazon, Facebook, make their money by selling advertisements. And, oh, isn't that nice? We, can, we have lots of information about all of you. We know all the things you read, we know all the things you do, we know what you watch, we know what you don't watch. Um, and isn't it nice if you sign up for those other companies by, through Facebook, you just heard about that a few minutes ago, um, then we know what you're doing in the other companies too, and we can package that all together and sell it to the advertisers. And so, the notion of privacy, forget it. You can, you can say, I don't want people to know my private stuff, but they do. You can't stop it. And yes, all those little blocking ads that pop up and get in your way and say, we use cookies. <laughs> do you accept? And it says, basically, it's if you accept, okay, we'll steal all your data. And if you don't accept, you can't use our website. That's not a choice. So that's the other problem. One problem is a relentless pursuit of short-term profits, and the other one is a relentless selling of our private data to anybody who will pay. That, both of those combined, is what causes the, this, this continual improvement in our devices that we must therefore dis, you know, discard the older devices. Now this device, for example, you know, the battery life of these is not very long. Why is the battery life so short? Well, <clears throat> let me back up for a second. Let me tell you about human-centered design. Because human-centered design has four fundamental principles. And what I like about these principles is they apply almost everywhere. Uh, the traditional way we teach is you're supposed to follow the principles in a particular order, but that isn't necessary. In fact, it's often wrong. But let me show you the principles. First, focus on people. Well, that may sound obvious to designers, but let me tell you, it's not obvious to engineers who design. It's not obvious to non-professionals who design. But focus on the people. And if you look at a lot of the systems in the world, they are optimized. There's all sorts of professions that optimize. And they optimize for price, or efficiency, or productivity, or maybe time, and cost. You didn't hear the word people in there, did you? 
Uh, I actually talked to a group of people that were optimizing service calls, the cost of service calls, when you call up and your stuff doesn't work. And what they wanted to do was reduce the amount of time of the service call. And I kept saying, well, it, it's obvious, isn't it, that if you had, if the service call were only five seconds, that would be a lot more efficient. You'd get a lot more calls done per hour, right? And they said, yes. And I said, but wouldn't you have really unhappy customers? Well, so what? We'd have more efficiency. Well, shouldn't you take a service call as an opportunity to spend more time with a customer? If you have a one-to-one -one relationship, if you can please them and make them happy, actually, they might actually prefer your company. In fact, there's evidence that says if somebody buys a product and it works perfectly and satisfies them, well, they're happy. If somebody buys a product and it goes bad or doesn't work quite right, and they call the service department, and the service department is immediately on top of that and helps you and solves the problem, in the end, you like that company better than the people who had no problems at all. Service calls can be a very powerful way of interacting with customers, yet people optimize it to be a minimum cost center with short, as short as possible phone calls or contact. Crazy. We focus on people, so that's line one. Line two, solve the right problem. It's very easy to solve the wrong problem. It's very easy to solve the symptoms. But one of the principles of human-centered design is ask why. When, something, when you're told to solve a problem, ask, why is that a problem? And when you're told the answer, say, well, why is that? And when you're told the answer, say, but why is that? I mean, this happened last night. Last night, um, I, I was doing what I do when I'm not giving talks. I was signing books and having my picture taken. And we were standing in the pre-conference party, and we were <coughs> uh, in this room, and suddenly the lights went out which made it difficult to sign books and difficult to take pictures. Well, so several people immediately said, ah, and they, they got flashlights or they turned on the flashlight of their cell phone or they said, well, my cell phone has a flash in it, I can take a picture in the dark, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So in other words, they were fixing the symptom. And I watched that for a while and I said, just a minute, and I simply said, why are the lights off? And I walked over to someone who looked like they might know, and I said, can you turn those lights back on? And they did. And quite often, though, to solve the real symptom, you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And you, how deep do you go? You go deep enough to you think you have the core reason, but it has to be a reason that you can do something about. Usually, it is important to solve the symptoms. But it's, more, it's also important to solve the underlying reason, because if you solve the symptom only, it's going to come back again. So that's the next principle. <clears throat> Focus on people. Solve the core underlying reason. The third is that everything's a system, everything that is interconnected. You have to think about the entire system. And if you don't, well, you may optimize a little component that, that is a problem, but you may actually make it worse for the total system. So you, it is important to look at the final system. And the last rule is very simple. It's that you're going to get it wrong. Just assume that it, life is too complex. We're not going to get it right. And conditions will change anyway. So always assume that you're going to be monitoring and changing. And before you release a product or a service, you should test it or modify it to it works as well as you can. But even after it's released, uh, you'll be watching it and modifying it. There are always things that will not be right. So those are the four basic principles, and they work very well. Now, Papanek didn't follow them. He said that the world is lots of unneeded crap. <clears throat> And what do we do about it? Well, it's designers who are responsible. No, 
Because if you ask why are designers responsible, you say, well, because they're building the wrong things, okay? Why are they designing and building the wrong things? Well, because they're told to. Well, why don't they refuse? Well, they can't because they're the middle level of a company and they, if they want to keep their job, you must do what you're told, basically. And, well, why are they told to build the wrong things? Well, because we have the wrong business model in place. We're looking at short-term gains instead of long-term. We're not thinking of the community. We should put the community first. Companies aren't charged for the full cost of what they do. When a company <coughs> spews pollution into the air, they aren't charged for that. When a company dumps waste into the water system, they aren't charged for that. This has been a known problem for some time. We know they should be paying the full cost of what they do. And uh, they also make things that are not easy to, re to recycle, to take the stuff back. And, it's, and the recycling is so complex, I bet none of you understand the recycling rules. It depends what country you're in, how the recycling is done, but it doesn't matter. I bet none of you understand how recycling is done and what can be recycled and what can't. I assure you that I don't understand it. In the United States, I just ask a simple question. Everybody says they understand it, and I say, okay, you know, milk comes in those cartons. Can you recycle the cartons? And everybody tends to say, well, yeah, it's, it's a kind of paper, isn't it? And the answer is no, you can't, because it's, it's a mixture of different materials that you can't take apart easily. And that's the point. If I make something out of leather, is leather recyclable? Well, kind of. It is wood recyclable? Yeah. Is leather bonded to wood recyclable? No, because you can't separate it. These are, they're so complex. And why do we use these complex things? Why do we make things that you can't recycle? Why do we make the phone that is so thin? Why does the battery not last? Well, one of the reasons the battery doesn't last because we, for some reason, we think a thin phone is good. If you made the phone a little bit thicker, you could have a bigger battery. And it would last longer, dramatically longer. On top of that, if you allowed it to be a little bit thicker, you could make the battery replaceable like it was a few years ago. The reason that they're not replaceable is they discovered Oh, if it's replaceable, it has to have sort of a protective cover over it. And if it's doesn't, not replaceable, it can be thinner. So we do a lot for arbitrary, ridiculous reasons. So, what can we do about it? Well, what we are trying to do in the design lab at the University of California, San Diego, is we're saying, you know, there are lots of good design schools around, so we don't need another design school. What we want to do is work on problems where we use design as a way of thinking and attacking important problems. So we want to look at things like hunger. We want to look at things like the lack of education. We want to look, or bad education, um, we want to look at things like um, health and sanitation and prevention of health, which is called public health. And it's, it's interesting that the people who do public health, preventing health care, are separate from the people who cure problems. And in fact, it's easier to get a lot of money to cure a problem than it is to prevent it in the first place. Uh, in the cancer research business, people have spent a billion dollars in order to prolong life a few months. And they won't spend a few million dollars in order to prevent the cancers in the first place. It's a very difficult problem. All these problems are difficult. So let me tell you about one of the problems we're working on. In the United States, the Federal Communications Commission is the organization of the government that is responsible for internet uh, and all of our, basically, communications systems. The internet, telephone systems, the wireless systems, the satellite systems, etc. So, <clears throat> they have a, a, a group of physicians that work for them. They're actually really good and smart and what they did was they looked at the internet connectivity across the United States. 
and they found a few areas where there was basically very little high bandwidth internet. And one of the areas is what's called Appalachia, which is a, um, a part of the United States that's in the East Coast, there's a range of mountains called the Appalachian Mountains. And people who live in the mountains are, uh, are isolated, the roads are very poor, there tend to be even one, one lane dirt roads, and uh, they live in small communities. They live in what's called hollows, which means um, that there's about maybe 10 families together, and they usually are related. And then they've lived there for, for generations. And so, again, they don't have much, they have difficulty traveling long distances. Their good medical care is about 200 kilometers away, but it takes a long time because of the quality of the roads. And in the winter, they're snowed in and they can't get out of their homes sometimes for several months. Well, not only do they have low internet, but they have the highest rates of lung cancer and heart disease and diabetes in the country. So the FCC says, oh, we'll give them high bandwidth internet. Well, that's solving the symptoms. Because they say, if we gave them that, then they could do telemedicine, remote medicine, or we could give them sensors so they could be monitoring their own body at times so that if we, when we knew they had a disease, we could be watching them and determine when they need some urgent care. Well, that's treating the symptoms. So let's go back and see why they're doing what they do. Well, the way we did it was we sent an anthropologist in uh, who sp and she spent about three or four months uh, with the community. And we discovered that, first of all, why do they have these diseases? Well, because they're overweight and they smoke a lot and they drink a lot. And why are they overweight? Well, because they, add, they eat fast food, poor food, food that's very fatty. And they don't get much exercise. Well, why is that? So I'm asking the why question. Well, because they don't have jobs. They don't have anything else to do. Okay, why don't they have jobs? Well, because the major jobs was coal mining, and we've stopped coal mining. So they don't have jobs. So in other words, if you want to prevent cancer, we have to get them jobs. Now, that is interesting because now this, the work that we are doing is sponsored by the Federal Communications Commission and by the National Cancer Institute. And we go back to the National Cancer Institute and say we have to figure out how to get them jobs, which is interesting because that's not the sort of thing they work on. But that's how we have to solve these problems. These are complex system problems. And what's important about it is that, well, they are really national major problems, and you'll find similar problems all around the world. If you look at cholera epidemics around the world, well, why do we have that? Well, because people have cholera and it's infectious, okay. But why do they have cholera? Well, uh, because they have bad sanitation. Uh, cholera is spread by feces. And, well, why do they have bad sanitation? Because they're homeless. And, well, why are they homeless? And you can begin to see again that all these problems are, well, we call them complex socio-technical problems. They are indeed complex problems. Now, how do we go about solving complex problems? Well, there are basically a few ways. Around the world, there are lots and lots of aid communities. There are private foundations, uh, and there are governments and the United Nations, all of whom spend billions and billions of dollars uh, providing aid to other nations or to their own nation to try to overcome these issues. And most of that money is, doesn't work. Uh, people spend billions of dollars and a decade or two and the problem does not get solved. In fact, the one thing that has resulted from a lot of these aids is now there's a whole industry of people who write books about why aid has failed. And one of my favorite books is called The Tyranny of Experts. So here's the problem with experts. So we'll just take a look at, say, the Gates Foundation, which is one of the better foundations around. They have spent billions and billions of dollars 
and most of it hasn't worked. In fact, the problem is bad enough that one of the severest critics of the Gates Foundation and how it's working is Bill Gates, who says, we've created a bureaucracy, the Gates Foundation, and it isn't solving the problems that we're trying to solve. So what's the matter? Well, the tyranny of experts by a man named Easterly says, the problem with expert knowledge is that in order to be, you want to apply it to a wide variety of situations. And so it's very general and abstract. And so the experts come in and they analyze the problem and they do a good job and they know what the real issues are and then they prescribe a solution. But the solution doesn't work for the local community. Uh, take a very simple case, a non -social, not a very complex problem, but water pumps. Uh, we've often provided water pumps to other countries, and they're fine, they work well, and it's useful, and then they break, and the, comp and the people in the country can't fix them. Instead, what we've discovered is if you make, if you make equipment like water pumps out of bicycle parts, then they can fix them because almost everywhere in the world people know how to work with and tinker with bicycles. If you make it with the local materials, if you, say, live in New Zealand or you know, it's Australia, one of those two, uh, it's number eight wire that they talk about in which you sort of put things together. In the United States, it's duct tape. And I don't know what it would be here, but there's always some little thing that you tinker with that somehow you manage to patch everything up with. And that's what people need to be able to do. So the experts don't know the local conditions. And it takes a long time to learn the local conditions. You can't go in in a few months and discover it. Uh, it's the people who live there who know them. Okay, well, let's look at... That's top-down design where somebody comes in and says, here are your problems and here's your solution. It has some other problems too. Uh, if you're living in a community and there are problems, would you like it if experts come in from, away, from, a, from, from a distance and say, oh, here's your problem, here's what you should do? It's not very well accepted. It's very paternalistic. It's what the British did to India. In, the British came into India and said, oh, I can see you guys are stupid and ignorant and you don't know how to run a government. But fortunately, the, the English are experts at running government, so we'll come in and we'll show you how to run your government and we'll introduce British bureaucracy, which is what they did to India, and they trained the Indians, but they never let them get to the full top. Well, I told this story to the Indians, and I said... Um, you liked that, didn't you? It was very useful to have the experts come in and help you. Yeah. Um, that's why there's a Gandhi Museum in Ahmedabad, because Gandhi was the guy who got them out of that. But um, that's kind of what designers do. We send our anthropologists in and we do our ethnography and we look at the situation and we say, oh, and now we understand the fundamental problem you have and then we go back and we do our ideation and we do our prototypes and we solve the right problem and we make sure it really works and we give it back. And then if we're working for a company or a foundation or whatever, the marketing people convince the people that this will solve the need which they didn't know they had. It's very paternalistic. And in, in the book by Easterly about experts, he has this wonderful cartoon of a person standing in front of a big machine saying, this will solve your need for clean water. And he's standing in the Sahara Desert and he's holding a plug in his hand and he says, where's the electric outlet? You have to know the local conditions. So that's top-down design. So let's look at bottom-up design. Bottom-up design is, there are lots of smart, creative people all over the world. There are 7.5 billion people in the world. And a lot of them, especially in problems where there's major issues, there's enough people that there's a lot of creativity as well. So let's find the creative people and say, oh, let's, you have some answers. Let's see if we can publicize that. Let other people build on that and use it. 
And these people don't have to send out anthropologists to understand their problems. They live there. They know it. So bottom-up design is taking advantage of local knowledge of the conditions. Now, it has its problems. One of the problems is they tend to solve the symptoms and not the underlying problem. And second, they don't think of it as a system. And they can't do either of these because to actually try to get to the underlying system, underlying problem, or the system requires a lot of resources and a lot of time and energy, and they simply don't have the resources to do that. Okay, maybe what we should do is combine top-down with bottom-up. Well, that leaves another problem. These are complex socio-technical systems. They're really big. And as you heard my description of the problem in Appalachia, uh, it, it, it requires quite a lot of uh, work to try to figure out how to solve, in this case, the lack of jobs. Because it's in a community without good roads, <coughs> uh, <clears throat> and other kinds of problems. So it isn't obvious, and, not, and the educational level isn't that high, so it isn't obvious what the jobs ought to be. And if it were easy to get new jobs in there, it would already be done. In fact, all of these problems are really difficult, because if they weren't difficult, they wouldn't be a problem anymore. So these are big problems, and big problems require a large amount of money and a large amount of time, which makes it very difficult to get permission to do. On top of that, we're going to impact a large number of people. And even though we may help the majority of people, we probably will harm a fairly large number of people as well. And those people will complain appropriately. And so this becomes a political fight. And so even if you get permission to go, usually you have to compromise a lot on what you're trying to accomplish in order to get permission. And because it's going to take many, many years to do, oh, political administrations change. In India, the prime minister changes every couple of years. And in all countries, well, I shouldn't say that. In many countries, the leaders change every few years. Any country that uses free democratic elections, uh, it's pretty unstable, actually. And also, once you embark on this big project, and it's going to take a decade, over that decade, things are going to change. The conditions will change. But once you start a huge project, it's very difficult to change the direction. Well, there's a solution to that, too. It's called, <clears throat> well, it's called, op it's, um, it's called opportunistic incremental solutions. So what we try to do is we analyze the system, we know where we want to go, and then we wait. We wait for an opportunity to do a small project in the right direction. Because if it's a small project, first of all, it doesn't get, it doesn't hard to get permission. Second of all, you can accomplish something relatively quickly. And because it's small, you don't have much opposition. And not, it's not expensive either. And if it works, then it makes it easier to get the next one. And if it doesn't work, it's not big enough that people get all upset and say, what a waste of taxpayers' money. Uh, it's a learning experience. Especially if you, if you explained it all in the beginning that these were going to be ex learning because we don't really know the correct answers. Because in some sense, there is no correct answer. Some, some methods are better than others. So <clears throat> what we wish to do is do opportunistic incremental learning with a top-down and bottom-up. Now, there are several ways of doing that. So one way is we take the expert knowledge, which includes designers, and we take the community knowledge, and we co-design, we work together to develop the answers. The way we're going to do a slight modification of that, what we would like to do, because we say we're worried about the fact that there are seven and a half billion people and we want to address the larger amount of people in the bottom, and there aren't enough designers, or even for that matter, experts to go around to solve all those problems. So what we would like to do is a modification of this. That is, we're going to take the community-driven people and help them. 
And so the experts will not say, here's what you should do. The experts will give advice and mentor and basically be facilitators. And then we also would like to build an educational system so everybody can get access to this in a free and open way. Now, there is an example of a really fantastic, powerful educational system that people don't usually think of as education. And the name of this powerful educational system is YouTube. Almost anything you want to learn about, you can find a video on on YouTube. It's really quite amazing. And they're usually short, and they're usually done by people who have figured it out by themselves. Then that makes them actually easier to understand, because they know the difficulties they had and what went wrong and how hard it was to think of it, as opposed to an expert or a professor who gives it, which makes it sound really easy and simple, when it isn't. It takes a lot of tinkering and study and uh, cleverness. The only problem with YouTube is, um, well, there's that nasty thing that YouTube is paid for by advertisements, and so it isn't necessarily the best environment. And second of all, uh, there are so many videos, uh, you don't know which ones are the good ones, and you don't know which ones are fake and which ones are not true. And so they need to be curated a little bit so that you know which ones are good. But there are, other, there are really good examples that aren't in YouTube, and one of them, for example, is the, um, the um, what's-his-name's institute, who does all the mathematics stuff, one of you will know. Short little videos on all sorts of aspects of mathematics, and now it's more of science, and now it's expanding. It's the Khan Academy, thank you. <laughs> So the Khan Academy was run by, started by a man named Khan because he got tired of answering all of his nephew's questions about how to do arithmetic and, and, and mathematics. And so he started making short videos so that he could just have them look at the videos. But that became very, very, very popular and now it uh, covers a wide variety of topics and they're all done by volunteers. And so we, would like, we are th now thinking of developing this kind of a learning platform. So what we are doing is we have a project in, App in uh, Appalachia. Uh, I've just spent uh, about three weeks in India talking to people there to form partnership. And, we want to s and what we want to do is set up this information structure that will be used. Uh, we're talking to the World Food Organization about doing a project in Africa on hunger. And we're talking to a major group in the United States who is looking at climate change. It's interesting, the United Nations has listed uh, 16 fundamental social issues that must be solved for sustainability. But number 13 of those issues is climate change. And those of us who look at it say, why is that number 13? Shouldn't that be number one? Because unless we actually take care of climate change, all the other things are irrelevant. But that's a really hard one to work on. It really is. But because it's hard to work on, doesn't mean we shouldn't work on it. And who better to work on these kinds of problems than designers? Because designers, you, are trained. First of all, <clears throat> you're not expert, most of you, in any given topic. And I could, that's, that's a plus, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, you are tutored, at least I hope you are, in those basic four principles. They may, not they may be described in different words, but basically those principles, which is, don't solve the question you're asked to solve, but try to understand what the real issue is. It's focus on the people. It's remember it's part of a system. And iterate. Do a prototypes, check, watch, modify. And those principles apply to everything. And because we don't know much about the topics, and yet design is a, is a system of making, 
In a university, almost all the departments are specialists. You're specialized in narrower, narrower things, more technical things. And you can't build a working system out of a specialty. In order to build a working system, you have to take the many specialists and combine their knowledge. And designers tend to be very good at that, because anything we build, we need to have other people come in and, and use their technical knowledge, or their medical knowledge, or the knowledge of the community. And so we are very good at putting this together. So that's one reason we're good at this, a good people. But there's one more thing I have to point out about the complexity of these problems. A complex system is complex. It has many feedback loops. So people were genetically created to really understand causality, that if I kick this, it will make a sound. I don't want to kick it too hard. So it made a soft sound. If I kicked it harder, it would make a louder sound. That's causality, right? It's fairly simple. There's a, there's a cause and there's an effect. Well, most life isn't like that. Most things aren't like that. There's a feedback loop. And that means whatever the output is goes back to the input. And if it's positive feedback, it makes the output even louder. And you've all probably experienced somebody giving a speech like this, and I stand in the wrong place, and suddenly there's a squeal. That's a positive feedback loop, because I make a sound that goes into the microphone, comes out amplified in the speakers. The microphone, <coughs> the sound from the speakers goes back into the microphone and comes out even louder and louder and louder, and it squeals. And it took a lot of technical expertise to make sure to get rid of that. That's a positive feedback loop. And a negative feedback loop is when the output comes back, it diminishes the signal, and that's actually very stable. Okay, well, those are simple. Um, a thermostat is a simple feedback loop. But what if you have a feedback loop where it takes an hour to have an impact? You may have experienced something like that when you've taken showers in a new hotel or something, and um, the water is too cold, so you turn it up to hot, and nothing happens, so you turn it again, and if nothing happens, and you turn it again, and then suddenly it's scalding. That's because there's a, feedback, the, there's a delay in the feedback, and it can be measured in, in seconds or even tens of seconds. Well, what if the delay is a decade? How do you know what you're doing? Now, what if there are a hundred feedback loops? We can understand one feedback loop, but not when there are three or four. And complex systems may have a hundred. On top of that, the feedback may change. It may be dynamic. Some days there's a feedback loop, and the next year there isn't. So complex problems are really complex. They're really hard, which is why we need to work on them. And a lot of you people have the skills to do it. But what we have to do is solve the other problems. The problem about the, <coughs> the false way that we try to optimize profits on a short-term basis for companies. The fact that uh, we build things with planned obsolescence, so they have to be thrown away and they're, they're difficult to take apart in any sensible way. And, and, and it's going to be hard to solve, which is why we should do it. And that's what I'm working on. And one of the things you have to do is get yourself up into a higher level of positions in your organization. Not necessarily all of you. Some of you don't want to do it. Uh, it's not necessarily comfortable as you rise up in an organization. You get more and more difficult problems. But we must have a sufficient number of designers who rise to the point where they're in the decision-making capability of whatever organization they're in. That can help point us to a better world. And you have the tools to do it. That's my message for you today. <laughs>